Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the astronomy instructor at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California. And it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone here in the auditorium and all those listening on the web to this uh, lecture in the 11th annual Silicon Valley Astronomy Lecture Series at Foothill College. Um, each time we present a noted astronomer sharing the excitement of astronomy with the public here and on the web. Uh, tonight's lecture, uh, like all the lectures, is co-sponsored by NASA's Ames Research Center, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, the SETI Institute, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute in Mountain View, and the Foothill College Astronomy Program. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Alex Filipenko, a uh, professor at the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Filipenko specializes in things that go bang, whether it's stars or other explosive phenomena, including the universe itself. That's his bailiwick in the study of the universe. He's a distinguished research professor in astrophysics at Berkeley. But in addition to all his good work in science, he is also one of the foremost popularizers of astronomy in the world today. Uh, he's been at this lecture series several times, and we're delighted to welcome him back. Uh, we got the idea for this appearance because I was sent by the teaching company, uh, which records great professors all around the world, a tape called Black Holes Explained, which is Dr. Filipenko doing in many hours what he's going to summarize briefly tonight, explaining all the fun aspects of black holes. It's called Black Holes Explained, and we were hoping that the uh, tapes would go on sale just as he's coming to talk to us, uh, but they're not on sale now, and he urges you to wait until they are on sale. So he's very nice about this. And uh, you can just go to the Teaching Company website. He'll have the website for you. It's his second course for the Teaching Company. And these courses are delightful. They're illustrated introductions to the most exciting aspects of modern astronomy. So this one is called Black Holes Explained. Um, Dr. Filipenko was recently elected to the National Academy of Sciences to honor his research work. But in addition, he's been elected seven times the most uh, popular professor at Berkeley. And a few years ago, he was chosen by the Carnegie Endowment for Higher Education as the professor of the year for the whole country in universities around the country. Um, as part of the uh, work that he does, he writes a textbook in astronomy, he records these courses, and year after year, he gives the most popular introductory course at Berkeley. In recognition of this work, he was recently chosen for a very special award. The Astronomical Society of the Pacific, which is a 120-year-old organization working in the interface between science and education, has uh, recently instituted a special award called the Emmons Award, which recognizes a lifetime of contributions to uh, higher education in astronomy. And I'm delighted to report that Dr. Filipenko is the 2010 Emmons Award winner. This is the first public announcement of this award. So. so we've asked him to uh, earn this award uh, by coming tonight and talking to us about one of his favorite subjects. And I think a subject that uh, is a favorite of the public, of science fiction writers, and of astronomers, uh, black holes. So it is both a professional privilege and a personal pleasure to introduce to you one of the great speakers in astronomy, Dr. Alex Filipenko. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy, for that very kind introduction. What Andy didn't tell you was that a few years ago, he was, I believe, the very first recipient of the ASP Emmons Award. Is that correct, Andy? The second. Oh, well, in that case, it doesn't count. No, he's the second. So I think we uh, should give a round of applause to Andy. And moreover, a few years ago, he was um, 
designated by the Carnegie Case people as the California Professor of the Year. So anyway, he's, he's no slouch in public education in astronomy either, and I'm delighted to be once again part of this lecture series that Andy so tirelessly puts together. And as he said, um, I like to talk about my favorite subjects. I've spoken about exploding stars here, about the expansion of the universe, and other topics. And today, I'll take, tell you about black holes, one of the greatest topics in, in modern astronomy. So you might wonder, well, why study black holes? Well, there are many reasons, but here's one reason. From a speech by former President Bill Clinton, look, there are so many more questions yet to be answered. And so I wonder, are we alone in the universe? What causes gamma ray bursts? What's in those black holes anyway, right? If the President of the United States in his science and technology policy address mentions black holes, then surely every educated American and even every educated person in the world should, should learn something about them. So there you go. I'll tell you today what we think is inside black holes, uh, a point of infinite or nearly infinite density called a singularity, where all the material that went into the black hole is uh, concentrated. So if Bill is here, is Bill Clinton here? Not just any old Bill, but Bill Clinton. Well, sorry, we'll have to send him the web link, Andy, so that he uh, can learn what black holes are. Anyway. <laughs> So, more seriously, a black hole is a region of space where matter is concentrated into such a small volume that the local gravitational field is sufficiently strong to trap everything. Nothing can escape, not even light. So if light can't escape, it doesn't get reflected, doesn't get transmitted, you know, doesn't get emitted, then the thing appears black. And so we call it a black hole. And here's one of my prize-winning photographs of a black hole. There it is right there. Um, my normal price is $10,000, but for you, friends of astronomy, five grand each. Special price. Or if you want to do it more cheaply, you can just keep the lens cover on your camera on. Or if you're making a PowerPoint or keynote presentation, just, just choose a black background. So I just, I just gave away my trade secret and have lost out on the opportunity of becoming really rich. But anyway, there it is. Um, you could say, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, because as I said, nothing can escape. So if you choose to wander into one of these things, or if you do so by accident, you're never going to get out again. So if you choose it, for example, as a PhD thesis, you'd better explore the black hole from outside its boundary, and not too close. I'll tell you about that later. Anyway, uh, black holes are part of pop culture. They, of course, appear in science fiction and things like that. We're getting a hum. Cool. Oh, OK. I won't use this one. This, uh, OK. So uh, that means I'm tethered more here. But that's OK. You, you don't want me to wander around. But that's all right. I'll, I'll stay here. Usually, I like to wander a bit. But anyway, it, it appears in pop culture quite a lot. And here you can see, of course, some, uh, some movies, Disney's flick from 1979 black hole, a journey that begins where everything ends, right? And then here's another one, Event Horizon, infinite space, infinite terror. Now, the Event Horizon is the boundary of a black hole, but from what I can tell, this movie actually has really nothing to do with black holes. But they know that if they choose black hole theme, it will suck people in and people will be attracted to it, and maybe they'll get more of a viewing audience then. Here's a Black Hole, Charles Burns' uh, graphic novel, which is sort of a compilation of his comic strips uh, uh, titled Black Hole. And again, it really has nothing to do with black holes. It's about some kids in Seattle that contract some terrible alien disease that turns them into zombies or something. But anyway, uh, it attracts people. Um, more examples of pop culture, greeting cards. This card is late. Another black hole starts to form, and wouldn't you know it, right in Sid's room. Now, as I will show you tonight, there's only certain conditions under which black holes can form. Rest assured, they don't form in Sid's room or in any of your rooms. Don't worry about this, but it's funny, you know, the dog, the clock, everything's being sucked in. Uh, where might you find black holes in nature? Well, here in the Bay Area, we have an excellent example of a black hole. 
in the Oakland Raiders uh, <laughs> fan section, there's a, there's a section with particularly rabid Oakland Raiders fans, and they call themselves the, the black hole or the black hole zone. And I think it's because anyone who happens to be wandering by this region of rabid foaming at the mouth fans will get sucked in inexorably by these fans, never to emerge again. Perhaps that's why they call themselves the black hole. <laughs> you know, anyway, not really, but it, it's amazing how much it appears in pop culture as a result. So as you can imagine, they're pretty fierce places. They suck you in and they hold on fiercely and never let go. So based on that idea, we have a saying, what happens in black holes stays in black holes, okay? <laughs> yes, some of you are familiar with the saying about Vegas. All right, well, if you Google black hole, you'll find that there's something like 36, maybe even up to now, 40 million hits. Uh, some of the first few websites are really quite good. The, the wiki article is good, and there's the Hubble site, which has lots of information about black holes. So there's a lot of actually very good websites about black holes. As you start going down in the list, some of the websites start becoming perhaps not quite as reputable, and you might want to watch out. You know, not everything on the internet is true, but there is a lot of good stuff about black holes on the internet. There's also some ads, look at that here, black hole, prices slashed, today only, free UPS service for you, okay? Um, I don't know, maybe this is some li liposuction company or something like that, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of good stuff out there, as well as, of course, this set of 12 lectures that, that Andy so generously uh, mentioned. All right, so let's go back to this definition that I gave and explore it a little bit more carefully. Let's go back and use a purely Newtonian argument suggesting that there might be at least in principle, objects whose local gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. So this goes all the way back to Newton. He himself did not make these arguments, but in the late 18th century, several other people did. Um, uh, John Mitchell and Pierre de la, uh, Simon de Laplace made these arguments. They, they said the following. Here we are on Earth, and let's say we hold an apple and the gravitational attraction between the Earth, M1, and the apple, M2, and by the way, this is the only equation you'll see tonight, I believe, is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So the Earth pulls on the apple, bringing it down. Now, I can toss this apple up and it comes down, and if I had eaten my Wheaties this morning, and if there weren't the technical problem of a ceiling, I could, in principle, throw this apple sufficiently fast that Although it's forever slowing down, it never comes to a complete stop and certainly never reverses its motion. That speed is known as the escape speed. From the surface of the Earth, it happens to be about 11 kilometers per second, about seven miles per second, all right? Now, suppose I were to take the Earth's mass and squish it down to half of its current radius, and I remain on the new compressed surface of this Earth. So here's my apple here. The two masses have stayed the same, but the distance between the apple and the center of the Earth, the center of mass, is now half of what it used to be. So one over one half squared is four. The force on the apple is now four times greater. That means I have to throw the apple faster in order for it to escape. Not four times as fast, it's a bit more complicated, but Nevertheless, a faster speed. The escape velocity increases. So now imagine compressing the Earth even more. The escape velocity at the new surface will increase even more. And you can imagine then compressing the Earth so much that the escape velocity reaches or even exceeds the speed of light. Now at the time of John Mitchell's work and Laplace's work, they didn't know that nothing can go faster than light. But at least they could say that, gee, you could in principle have an object from which material, or at least from which light, can't escape. And it now turns out that we know that material objects can't escape either because none of them can exceed the speed of light. And they suggested that dark stars might in fact exist from which light doesn't escape. Now it turns out you'd have to compress the Earth to the size of a walnut in order for the local speed to reach, the local escape speed to reach the speed of light. 
And that's hard to do. There's no cosmic vices that are going to do that. But at least in principle, you can imagine squishing the Earth down this way to such a point where the escape velocity reaches or exceeds the speed of light. And that then would be an object from which light can't escape. And when we bring in relativity and the idea that nothing can go faster than light, that means nothing can escape and you have a black hole. Now, to do it right, you need not a Newtonian argument, but you need an argument Envelop, in, encompassing all of general relativity and the curvature of space and time in the presence of mass. And that's what Einstein did. And in that case, an object forms this dimple, a warp, in space and time around it. But as you make the object denser and denser and denser, the warp becomes progressively stronger. The sides become steeper and steeper until eventually you compress it so much that the sides of the warp become effectively vertical. And nothing can escape, in a sense, because in trying to climb out of this well, they use up all their energy. That's one way of thinking of even light, trying to escape from a vertical well. It maybe does so, but it loses all its energy in the process, and so there's nothing coming out. It ceases to exist, and so it really can't uh, escape. Or it goes around in circles like that, if it's not going trying to go go up the sides like that. But in any case, that would then be a black hole, a region of extreme space-time curvature in Einstein's general relativistic formulation of the physics. But even with the Newtonian argument, some people had the idea that there might be such objects. And um, Einstein proved, and his disciples and, and other people studying general, general relativity proved that in principle, such a mathematical object could exist. That doesn't mean that nature chooses to make such objects, okay? There's a difference between being possible in principle and actually finding examples in nature of, of such a phenomenon. Well, how might nature make such an object? I said that there are no cosmic vices that would compress the Earth to the size of a walnut, but there might be something that can compress a star to the proper size to make it a black hole. And one such mechanism is exploding stars. Now, most exploding stars don't form black holes, but some, we think, may, in fact, form a black hole in the central region, and the remaining stuff expands outwards. It explodes. And in particular, the types of exploding stars that we think are best at producing black holes are the so-called gamma ray bursts. If you look at gamma rays up at the sky using gamma ray satellites, you find that roughly once a day, somewhere in the sky, there's an intense burst of gamma rays, high energy electromagnetic radiation. And we now think that those intense bursts of gamma rays are associated with the birth of black holes or the growth of black holes when a black hole eats another star. And here's the idea. In some cases, massive stars are rotating sufficiently quickly and are sufficiently massive such that the collapsing core at the end of the life forms a black hole. And all the energy in this material here can get channeled through two oppositely directed jets. They go pummeling out of the star, forming these high-speed high jets. And if our line of sight happens to be along the direction of one of those two jets, then we see a truly brilliant flash Whereas if we're viewing the explosion, and by the way, the rest of the star explodes, even though the middle imploded, but if you're viewing the explosion from the side, you see a more normal supernova, only a few billion times the, the brightness of the sun, rather than you know trillions of times as, as bright as the sun uh, as you get when you watch this thing down the, down the axis of, uh, of this beam. So that's what we think gamma ray bursts are. They're the birth of a black hole following the collapse of the core of an exceptionally massive star that's rotating at just the right rate and has other properties to allow the formation of these two rapidly moving beams of particles and light. But in the middle of this exploding star, you get the birth of a black hole. Also, when two neutron stars, which are usually the things left over when a star explodes, if you've got two neutron stars orbiting one another sufficiently closely, then those two neutron stars can merge together and form a black hole. And that's thought to be the reason for some gamma ray bursts as well. Or maybe you have a neutron star being eaten by a black hole. 
that would be the rapid growth of a black hole, and it can produce a gamma ray burst as well. So it's the gamma ray bursts that we think are associated with the birth or growth of what we call stellar mass black holes, black holes that are basically as massive as massive stars are, and the agent that compresses the material, rather than being a mechanical vice, it's just gravity. Gravity causes a collapse of the central region or a merging of these two neutron stars, and they form a black hole producing a gamma ray burst. So that's one way we think nature can produce black holes. The other way is by concentrating a large amount of material in the central part of a galaxy. Now, a galaxy, a gigantic collection of hundreds of billions of stars, maybe 100,000 light years across. But in the central region, in some cases, in fact, we think in many or most big galaxies, there forms a central concentration of gas that then undergoes gravitational collapse, forming a black hole. Not just a puny stellar mass black hole having 10 or 20 times the mass of the sun, but rather what's called a supermassive black hole forming uh, or having masses of millions or even billions of times the mass of the sun. And I'll show you observational evidence for both types of black holes in due course. So how do we find these things? Okay, here's, you know, this is how we expect that they're produced, but how do we actually find them if they're black? Well, you could just take photographs of random parts of the sky and look for arrows. And where you see arrows, <laughs> there's, uh, there's black holes right there, right? Well, obviously, it has to be a bit harder than that because we give degrees for this kind of research, and if it were that easy, we, we wouldn't give degrees. Um, you know, uh, blackness in space could simply just be a, an absence of stars and galaxies. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a black hole there. Here's a Sidney Harris cartoon based on this idea. It's black, and it looks like a hole. I'd say it's a black hole. Well, again, it's, it's not quite that simple. The absence of light alone does not guarantee that you've got a black hole. Um, so how do we find them? Well, we rely on their gravitational influence on their surroundings. It turns out that many stars, in fact, one could say even most stars, are not solitary, but they are parts of binary systems. They are gravitationally bound together. They orbit their common center of mass. And you might not even know this if you're just looking at a star, because it looks like a solitary star, but if you examine it through a telescope, you might see two stars there. But even then, you might see only one star. But if you take its spectrum, then you can tell that there are two stars. You take the light, call it starlight. Sorry, I stole this from either Andy's book or my book. And this is the spectrum of the sun. But you could have starlight coming in from this apparently single star. And you spread the light out into a rainbow or the component colors or wavelengths. And you can see these dark lines here, which are due to chemical elements in the atmosphere of the star absorbing certain wavelengths. And normally, there's only one set of lines like this. These are due to sodium. These down here are due to calcium, and so on. Gravity keeps on knocking over. Well, I knock over my water, and then the gravity does the rest, OK? But if you take the spectrum of the star over the course of time, you might notice uh, the following. And interestingly enough, yeah, my. Uh, my animation is gone. Oh, well, it's just gone. See that? We had this problem before, but oh, well, no big deal. What you see are two sets of lines, and they go back and forth and back and forth as these two objects orbit one another, because it's kind of like the, oh, now I've completely messed it up, right? To err is human. To really foul up requires a computer. Oh, gosh, good. I, I uh, got it to advance. OK, let me try it again now. If you watch this thing from, say, over there, and that's what my little animation showed, then at times this star is moving towards you, so the absorption lines that it produces are blue shifted, and this one is moving away from you, so the absorption lines are red shifted. And then this one becomes blue shifted, and that one becomes red shifted. Light experiences a similar phenomenon as the audible Doppler effect that you've all heard when a siren goes past. It goes like that. That's because the waves are squished as the object is coming toward you and spread apart as it's moving away. Now, if you hear a siren going ee-yaw, ee -yaw, ee -yaw, it doesn't mean that the driver is going in circular motion and is drunk or something like that. It just means that that's the natural tone of the, 
of the siren, but you can still hear a generally high-pitched ea morph into a low-pitched ea as the thing um, you know passes you, and and so that's the audible Doppler effect. But we see this in stars as well. So if you look at the spectrum of of this binary star, you can see two sets of lines going back and forth, and you can tell then that it's a, a binary star. Now, suppose one of the two stars has turned into a black hole. Its gravity is still there, right? I mean, it's still acting gravitationally on its companion, and they're two, they're, they are still orbiting their common center of mass, but this one won't produce any absorption lines. So you'll see one set of absorption lines going back and forth, back and forth. And I'm sorry, my little uh, animation doesn't seem to be showing on my screen. It was when we prepared the talk, but oh well. And so when you have one set of lines going back and forth, you can figure out how massive the object must be that's causing the visible star to undergo circular motion. And if that mass is very large, greater than say three or five or 10 times the mass of the sun, yet you see no visible evidence for the star that's pulling on the visible star, then by the process of elimination, it becomes reasonable to suggest that that's a black hole. Basically, because we haven't thought of anything else it could possibly be, and we've found no other objects in the universe that could have so much mass crammed into such a small volume, yet not be visible in any way. In other words, the black hole becomes the conservative conclusion. Any other conclusion would be more radical, all right? So that then becomes a good black hole candidate. All right, well, but which stars should you monitor? There are millions of stars, billions of stars in our galaxy. There's not enough telescope time to take sequentially spectra of more than a handful of these things looking for you know, a single set of lines zapping back and forth. You need a clue which ones are likely to be the ones that are orbiting black holes, because most stars are not orbiting black holes. Well, a clue comes from X-ray wavelengths. Let me move this annoying arrow out of the way. If you have two stars in orbit around one another and one of the stars is stealing material from its companion, and if that star is very compact, let's say it's a neutron star, which is a very compact star, or let's say it's a black hole, then the material falling in, rubbing, all the gas particles and dust particles are rubbing against their neighbors and they're falling in a very strong gravitational field because there's a lot of mass in a small volume there. They're falling fast, they hit against each other, they heat up to very high temperatures, okay? And they emit X-rays. Now most stars do not emit X-rays profusely. Our sun emits some X-rays, but it emits a heck of a lot more visible radiation. But these stars then would be emitting X-rays. And this accretion disk that forms is clumpy. It's not uniform. And when clumps of material undergo inst instabilities and fall toward the compact object, then they emit a burst of X-rays. And so not only is the star emitting X-rays, but there might be a gigantic burst of X-rays it becomes what's called an X-ray nova. Now, to produce such large quantities of X-rays, you need a very compact object there, either a neutron star or a black hole. So those stars that become X-ray novae are good candidates for looking for a black hole because there's either a neutron star or maybe a very compact white dwarf, but even white dwarfs generally don't produce a lot of X-rays, or you have a black hole. So there are satellites like the Chandra X-ray Observatory flying around above Earth's atmosphere that study the sky at X-ray wavelengths, okay? And they find stars that undergo these X-ray outbursts. And then the rest of us get really excited. Ooh, there's an X-ray nova. Maybe that's a star orbiting a black hole. So we start monitoring it and it brightened not only at X-ray wavelengths, but at ultraviolet and visible infrared as well. So you have to wait until the nova dies down. That is, you have to wait until the secretion disk dies down and becomes faded so that you can then see the light of the relatively normal star. Otherwise, the light is dominated by, the, by this outburst from the accretion disk. Once you see the light from the relatively normal star, you can take a sequence of spectra see whether the absorption lines are moving back and forth and determine the mass 
of the object that's pulling on your unseen companion. I mean, sorry, that's pulling on the visible companion. So here's one of these objects. It's, it was found by a Japanese X-ray satellite called Ginga in the 1980s. And this number here tells you roughly where it is in the sky. It was an X-ray nova. My team then waited patiently until the X-rays and ultraviolet and optical light all died down until finally we saw what we thought was just the normal, quiescent, visible star. We then used one of the two 10-meter Keck telescopes in Hawaii to take a sequence of spectra of that visible star, 13 spectra over the course of one glorious summer night. And, you know, the Keck mirror was able to gather enough light from this faint star to allow us to actually see these weak little absorption lines and to see that they're actually moving back and forth, back and forth. There is something pulling on that visible star. And the Keck telescopes are wonderful to use. I love them. Here's Fred Chaffee, a former director of the Keck Observatory, sitting in the hole in the primary mirror showing you the scale, 10 meters of the Keck telescopes. Now, usually he wasn't there while we were taking data. Um, <laughs> This is just a PR shot because the extra light gathering power provided by the eye of a human is dwarfed by the collecting area of this light here. But anyway, it just shows you really how big these wonderful light buckets are. And when we measured these absorption lines going back and forth, using the Doppler formula, we could convert the wavelengths or colors into the speed that must be causing those shifts in wavelength. And again, I wish I had my little demo here for you, but I don't, so that's the way it goes. And we found that if we plot this speed measured from the absorption lines, so-called radial velocity, because the Doppler effect tells you how quickly something is going toward you or away from you, not how quickly it's going transverse to your line of sight. But anyway, if we measure the radial velocity as a function of time, we found that well, for a while, the visible star was moving away from us at 520 kilometers per second. Four hours later, it was moving toward us at 520 kilometers per second. Another four hours later, it's again moving away from us. And the points in between beautifully are fit by a sine wave, a sinusoid, which is um, sort of the, the hallmark of circular motion. So the visible star is in circular motion around something else, more precisely around the center of mass between it and something else, but whatever. And from the speed and the orbital period, you can use Newton's laws to figure out the mass of the object that's pulling on the visible star. And it turns out to be at least five times the mass of the sun, and more likely, once you take into account the inclination of the system, eight or nine times the mass of the sun. So here's an object that's eight or nine times the mass of the sun pulling on the visible star, yet there's no evidence for any light being emitted by this massive object. Normal stars that are eight or nine times the mass of the sun are incredibly luminous. So it's not a normal star. It's also not a collection of little sun-like stars in a small volume because we would see them as well. And it can't be a neutron star or a white dwarf because they have a maximum mass limit, which cannot be exceeded, of roughly one and a half solar masses for white dwarfs, roughly three solar masses for neutron stars. So this becomes a very good black hole candidate. Dynamically, it looks like there's a black hole there. That is, it's influencing its surroundings in a way consistent with that expected of a black hole. So then I'm a very happy camper when we get data like this, and this shows you the real reason we build observatories in Hawaii. I like swimming in the ocean as much as any of you, and I personally find Northern California waters to be a bit too cold without a wetsuit, and to me, a wetsuit is a big pain to put on, so. Uh, but there are good scientific reasons for building these things in Hawaii as well, okay. Our team has found a bunch of these types of objects. This one shows, in fact, the visible star bound to what we believe is the most massive stellar mass black hole ever found. And that one is 30 solar masses. Typically, the ones that have been found are 15 or below, 10, 5, 7, 8, 9, that kind of thing. 
This one is 30 solar masses, or at least 23, okay? So that's the most massive one. And you might say, okay, well, that all, all sounds good, and we now have several dozen cases of these stellar mass black holes in binary systems, but do we really know that they are black holes? Have we seen anything go, go beyond the so-called event horizon, the boundary of a, of a black hole beyond which nothing can escape from, okay? And the evidence that we have seen this, at least tentative evidence, is the following. There are these binary systems where the mass calculation suggests that there's a neutron star, and there are other binary systems where the mass calculation suggests that you have a black hole. In the cases where we have a neutron star, the material that's being accreted eventually falls, clunk, oops, sorry about that. Well, why am I apologizing to a podium? Anyway, um, <laughs> I do that sometimes. Here, the material, the falling apples, you know, they're picking up speed and they fall onto a surface and they liberate their kinetic energy, their energy of motion when they hit that surface. That makes this system glow quite a lot, all right? It's the glow not just from the accretion disk, but from the material hitting the actual surface of the star. If instead you have a black hole, then the material never hits a surface. And so there isn't the extra liberated kinetic energy, right? Because the falling apples go past the event horizon of the black hole and end up in the singularity somewhere. And so there isn't that extra radiated energy. And what we've found is that the black hole X-ray binaries appear to be darker, they're less luminous than the neutron star X-ray binaries or X-ray novae. So that's some indirect evidence that stuff is actually passing beyond an event horizon. Additional evidence comes from an object called Cygnus X1. Now this is an artist's rendition, but the data suggests that a blob that we saw falling into the putative black hole in Cygnus X1 faded and became redder, for a reason I'll tell you later, consistent with what's expected if it's entering or falling into the gravitational field of a black hole. And eventually, it just faded completely. We lost sight of this blob of gas completely as though it went behind or beyond an event horizon. So, you know, we haven't grabbed one, we haven't stuck one in our labs yet, fortunately, right? That would be like Sid's room. Um, but we have pretty darn good evidence that there really are stellar mass black holes out there. Let me now tell you about the supermassive black holes. Those are the ones thought to form in the central regions of galaxies. The idea is this. In the central region of a galaxy, you have lots of stars. They gravitationally pull on one another, causing them to move just like stars in binary systems pull on one another, causing each other to move. Without a black hole, the amount of mass causing the motion of each individual star is just some amount, causing those individual stars to move by some amount. If in addition you have the mass associated with a supermassive black hole, millions or billions of times the mass of the sun, then you have an extra speed, these, these stars, in order to successfully, stably orbit the black hole, they have to move more quickly. You can just figure that out from Newton's laws of motion, um, okay? And so with a black hole, there's the gravity, not only of the regular stars, but of the black hole, pulling on the surrounding stars, causing their motions to be greater than in the absence of the black hole. So what you wanna do is look in the central regions of galaxies, monitor the motions of stars, either individually, which we can do for the middle of our own galaxy, or collectively, which we do when we look at other galaxies that are very far away, and see whether the stars are moving unusually quickly. If they are, then that could be the signature of a black hole. So our own galaxy is the one of which we have the clearest view, not at optical wavelengths, such as in this photograph, because there's a bunch of what I call galactic smog, interstellar gas and dust that actually blocks our view of the center of our own galaxy at visible wavelengths. Much like on a foggy day, you can't see buildings that are a few blocks away. But you can still hear your favorite radio station, right? So radio waves can pass through this interstellar matter much more easily than optical light. 
And infrared light can do it pretty easily as well, not quite as easily as radio waves, but certainly more easily than visible light. So when we look at the galactic center at infrared wavelengths, we can actually see individual stars. Here's a ground-based image of the central region, and you see that in the central uh, tiny volume, there's a bunch of blurry things. The blur is caused by the Earth's atmosphere. If we turn on a technique called adaptive optics on our largest telescopes, then we get much, much greater clarity. Uh, those of you who are avid amateur astronomers will know what I mean by one arc second. You can see the size of, this, of the stars here look much smaller than one arc second, whereas here they're comparable to one arc second. So with adaptive optics, over a small region of the sky, you get clarity rivaling that or even superior to that of the Hubble Space Telescope. With the Keck 10-meter telescopes, we get four times the clarity, admittedly over a small region of the sky, but nevertheless, four times the clarity of the Hubble. That doesn't mean I'm a Hubble basher. I love Hubble. I'm a Hubble hugger. But Hubble's not the only way to get clear images of limited regions of the sky, OK? And so my colleagues, Reinhard Gensel at Berkeley and at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and Andrea Gez at UCLA have had, for years now, two decades in fact, two independent teams that have been monitoring the motion of stars in the central region of our galaxy. And what they find is the following. The year is given up here, and you see these stars go zoom, zoom. I mean, I, I love to watch these things, right? Watch, watch this one here. This one goes zoom, zoom. I mean, and these are the data points, and here's the, the Newtonian orbital fit to the data. Now, these stars went very quickly around an unseen object. You might say, well, there's a red cross there, but we stuck that in. In fact, there's a black hole there, and a black hole is an excellent place to have a red cross medical station. Because if you get too close, as some of these stars surely will someday, they will get torn apart. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Anyway, when you, when you look at these data, you find that the only thing that's consistent with the observed motions of these stars is something that has a mass of four million times the mass of the sun within a volume no bigger than our solar system. That is, out to Pluto, or Uranus, let's say, or Neptune, since Pluto doesn't really count anymore, right? Anyway, um, well, it does, but it's just not a planet. Anyway, and I, and I agree with Michael Brown, so you can lynch me as well. Um, but I didn't do it, so don't lynch me, okay? Uh, so uh, anyway, it's a large amount of mass within a volume no bigger than, than that of the solar system. This, in fact, is the very best evidence for black holes. In other words, this is even better, by a long shot, actually, than the evidence provided uh, among the X-ray novae that I just discussed. This is really... It's very, very difficult to explain this in any way other than with a black hole, because there's no way you can cram that much material into such a small volume, basically. Okay? And this has been done now not only for our own, our own galaxy, but for other galaxies as well, notably with the Hubble Space Telescope and also with the Keck telescopes. With adaptive optics, you can do this. Um, you then see collectively the motions of a bunch of stars in other galaxies, and so the constraints aren't quite as good as with the data provided by individual stars in our own galaxy. Nevertheless, the case is quite compelling. In galaxies such as M87, there's a gigantic mass within a very small volume right in the middle. And I always said, and Andy and other astronomers always said that it's three billion solar masses, but recent new calculations and models by astronomers at the University of Texas suggest that we may have underestimated the mass of this monster by a factor of two or even two and a half. Um, this is still a bit controversial, but it might be a six or seven billion solar mass object within a very small volume. Again, probably a black hole. Here's the Sombrero galaxy, Messier 104, very beautiful galaxy. It has a 700 million solar mass dark object in the middle. Again, you can tell from the collective motions of the stars. Our neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy, much like our own galaxy in many ways, well, it too has a central black hole, but it is blessed with a much more massive black hole than our own Milky Way. Our own Milky Way got cheated in a sense. Not that size matters necessarily, but 
you know, in the Andromeda galaxy, there's a 140 million solar mass black hole. In our own seemingly similar galaxy, the Milky Way, there's only a four million solar mass black hole. And we're not quite sure why there's this difference between our galaxy and Andromeda in the very central region. In fact, a correlation has been found between the size of the elliptical galaxy or the bulgy part of a spiral galaxy. Let me go back a couple of slides. There's the bulge of Andromeda. There's the disk and spiral arms of Andromeda. Here's the bulge of the Sombrero galaxy. Here's the disk of the Sombrero galaxy. M87 is only a bulge in a sense. It's what's called an elliptical galaxy. Well, the curious thing is, is that the size of a black hole in the center of a galaxy appears to be strongly correlated, not with the overall size of the galaxy as a whole, if you include the disk, but rather with the size and compactness of the bulge region. The big bulge galaxies, especially those where a lot of stars are crammed into a relatively small central region of that bulge, so by big I mean massive, and by crunched up I mean a lot of stars are near the central region, those, those galaxies have the biggest black holes, and galaxies with smaller bulges and bulges that aren't as compressed toward the central region, they tend to have smaller black holes. And in fact, there are some disk galaxies, some spiral galaxies that have virtually no bulge, and they have almost no evidence for a black hole. I mean, I won't say that there's no black hole there. I should have put that in quotes, except it's someone else's slide there might be a 1,000 solar mass black hole there, but we can't tell. The data aren't good enough to tell us whether there's no black hole there or only a 1,000 or 10,000 solar mass black hole. But virtually none compared to millions or billions, right? And we don't quite yet understand this correlation, but clearly it's telling us something about galaxy formation and black hole formation. The two seem to go together. Whatever it is that draws in and causes a lot of stars to form in a bulge also allows the process to go even farther. Some of the material, about half a percent of the material, collapses all the way down to the center and forms a black hole. And those galaxies that form big bulges form big black holes, and the little bulges have only little black holes. But bulge formation and evolution and supermassive black hole formation are intimately tied together and are telling us something important about the formation and evolution of galaxies, and we're still trying to figure that out. Now, there's been additional evidence for black holes in the central regions of galaxies, and this evidence goes back even several decades. You look at galaxies, and most of them have a central concentration of light, but some have, in addition to the normal starlight, a very bright, central region, a nucleus that's brighter than it normally would have been. And these so-called active galaxies show a lot of evidence that the process by which the nucleus is anomalously bright has nothing to do with normal stars. It's not a bunch of supernova explosions, much as I'd like it to be, perhaps. It's rather thought to be black holes, a giant black hole, swallowing material from the surroundings. And we see many of these objects, here's one, where it's clearly the bright central region of a galaxy. And in fact, quasars are an extreme example of this, where in some cases you don't even see the galaxy very easily. But the bright central region is being powered by some sort of a process that's very efficient in producing radiated energy. And material falling into a black hole in an accretion disk is a very efficient way to radiate energy because the particles rub against one another and they heat up and they radiate electromagnetic radiation at an efficiency that's at least 10 times higher than the efficiency of nuclear energy. And nuclear energy is thousands, even tens of, tens of thousands of times more efficient than, than chemical en energy like burning. And this process can even give rise to relativistic jets, that is jets of very rapidly moving material. Kind of similar to what I showed you for the stellar case of a gamma ray burst. What we think is happening is there's a supermassive black hole with an accretion disk around it. And through a combination of either forming a nozzle because of the natural thickness of this accretion disk 
or perhaps through the action of magnetic fields. Magnetic fields can also channel charged particles, as they do in the case of pulsars. Many of you know that pulsars are rapidly rotating, highly magnetized neutron stars. Anyway, by a combination of the disk and magnetic fields, particles can be accelerated along the axis of rotation of the black hole, and that's what forms these relativistic jets that we see. Now, many newspaper articles will say that astronomers have seen material coming out from a supermassive black hole in a quasar or in an active galaxy. That's not quite right. What we see is material coming out from the vicinity of the black hole. The particles are energized and pushed out along this axis in the vicinity of the black hole. No particles are actually escaping from within the event horizon itself, okay? But in loose talk in, uh, in articles, they often just are kind of glib about this and they, they get it a bit wrong. And as I said, quasars, which were first identified in the 1960s, are the extreme example of a supermassive black hole accreting a lot of material, maybe like one to 10 solar masses of gas per year, and some of that gas becomes very hot glows and causes the quasar to far outshine the 100 billion normal stars in the rest of the galaxy. And Sir Martin Rees and a few other people, Donald Lyndon Bell, in the mid-1960s quickly came to the conclusion that quasars are probably powered by this process, again by the process of elimination. But now we actually have measurements of gas orbiting in the vicinity of a quasar or stars orbiting in the middle of of galaxies that used to be quasars, and we have more direct evidence that the black holes really are there. But they were suspected to be present even four decades ago when quasars and active galaxies were being studied. So it's interesting that we now have a lot of evidence for the existence of black holes, the stellar mass variety, the supermassive variety. Einstein himself didn't think that black holes exist. They think that they were a mathematical curiosity, or he thought that they were a mathematical curiosity of his laws of general relativity, of his equations. But he didn't think nature has any way of actually compressing material to such a small volume. So he thought it was just a mathematical curiosity. Here he is, perhaps sad, that one of the most bizarre predictions of his theory doesn't have an actual counterpart in nature. But Einstein died in 1955, I believe, around then, before the evidence for black holes became available. What would his reaction be if he were alive right now, confronted with the evidence that I've just presented to you, observational evidence for the existence of black holes? His reaction might be something like this, okay? <laughs> and really, in the case of our Milky Way galaxy, we're virtually certain. It's nearly 100%. I mean, I, I, I'd almost bet my life, I'm not quite at that stage because a life is a very precious thing, but I'd certainly bet my house that there's a black hole in the middle of our galaxy, and that's an easy thing to do because I rent, so. But I'd, um, you know, I'd, I'd, bet, I'd bet my cat that I love very much, but, you know, anyway. We really think black holes do exist. All right, a few more things, and then we'll do Q&A, but let me first dispel some popular myths about black holes. The first is uh, related to this idea that black holes are these cosmic vacuum cleaners and they can form just anywhere, not only in Sid's room, but in Darren Belsky's room as well. Suddenly, through forces not yet fully understood, Darren Belsky's apartment became the center of a new black hole and started sucking everything in. I hope I've convinced you that black holes form in nature only under very special circumstances. You need something to compress material into a very small volume. Usually that something is gravity. We don't know of any other vices that uh, will do this. So don't worry, be happy. A black hole isn't about to devour your house, okay? The other um, misconception is that black holes that do exist, and we, we really do think that they exist, are these really dangerous things that go sucking up everything around. And in fact, many of you have seen me on some shows that I would say overly sensationalize astronomy, perhaps to make it 
more interesting to those who are not already interested. You are the converted. You're already, to some degree, interested in astronomy. But, you know, it's the ratings game on TV. If people flip the channel and watch the football game or sumo wrestling or whatever, then, you know, these science documentaries uh, won't get approved for future seasons. And uh, so that's why they sometimes overly sensationalize things. But they have sometimes made it sound like black holes are these really terrible things that are about to devour the universe. And in particular, suppose our sun were to turn into a, into a black hole. Would it become this cosmic vacuum cleaner? You know, that would suck in everything, including us and all the other planets in the solar system? Absolutely not. We, here on Earth, are on a stable orbit around our sun. Gravitationally, we don't care whether our sun is the sun or a black hole of equal mass. Now, from the perspective of life, we do care. The sun gives us light and heat and all that. But from a gravitational perspective, we really don't care. Could have been a black hole. From our distance from that, from the sun, Newtonian gravity is basically just like Einsteinian gravity. We're not going to get sucked in. So don't worry. First of all, our sun is not going to turn into a black hole. It's not massive enough. It'll turn into a white dwarf. And secondly, even if, even if it were to turn into a black hole, we wouldn't get sucked in. All right. So only if a black hole becomes really quite close to the solar system do we have anything to worry about. There is an interesting aspect of black holes, however, and this is not a myth. It's called tidal forces. If you're near a black hole, especially near a small black hole, a so-called stellar mass black hole, then the force on your feet is significantly greater than the force on your head because your feet are closer to the center of the black hole than your head is. So the force big F is bigger than little f, and your feet get pulled toward the black hole more than your head does. That means you get stretched apart like this, especially near a low mass black hole. Near a massive black hole, the event horizon, whose radius is proportional to the mass, might be, you know, billions of kilometers instead of just three kilometers, which is, which is what it would be for a one solar mass black hole, or, or 30 kilometers for a 10 solar mass black hole. My height is about two meters. Compared to uh, 30 kilometers, that might seem small, but nevertheless, it's significant, and my feet would get pulled a lot more than my head. But if I were near a supermassive black hole, my two meter height is really quite insignificant compared to the billion kilometer radius of the event horizon of the black hole. So this stretching effect is smaller. But if you're near a black hole and you get closer and closer, the stretching gets more and more. And the official term that we get, that we give to this process is spaghettification. Okay? <laughs> you get turned into a, a piece of human spaghetti. So if you're a PhD thesis student, and you want to study the environment of a black hole, choose wisely. Choose a supermassive black hole, like in the middle of our galaxy, not a stellar mass black hole. Because from a tidal perspective, a stellar mass black hole is much more dangerous than a supermassive black hole, because you get tidally disrupted outside the event horizon of a stellar mass black hole, whereas you don't necessarily get tidally disrupted, uh, depending on your distance in the environment of a, of a supermassive black hole. So, so choose wisely. Now, suppose you were to throw your mortal enemy toward a black hole. What would happen? So let's say you're Yoda, OK? And you're throwing Darth Vader. Maybe I should have chosen Luke. You know, and he would say, but Luke, I'm your father. And he, Luke says, well, to hell with you anyway. Anyway, so um, you, you throw him into a black hole because you just, you know, you're trying to rid the galaxy and the universe of this terrible evil. What would you actually see? Well, first of all, you would see Vader's clock slow down. That's a relativistic effect. From your perspective, it would appear that Vader never crosses this boundary, the event horizon of the black hole, because it would take an infinite amount of time from your perspective. The only, to my knowledge, practical application today of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Special relativity and quantum mechanics have many practical applications. But anyway, all right, so that's what you would see. So. You synchronize two clocks far from the black hole, four hours might have passed. You know, near a black hole, two hours might have passed. And the closer you are to this so-called event horizon, the, sh the slower is, is the apparent running of the clock uh, of Vader until he reaches the event horizon, at which point,
from our perspective, time, his time comes to an end. So you won't have the pleasure of seeing him cross the event horizon. Now, suppose Vader goes close to the black hole and then turns on some really powerful retro rockets and escapes before crossing the event horizon. Vader will come back not younger than he was when he first went to the black hole, but younger relative to Yoda or Luke, who aged at a more rapid rate being far from the black hole. So Luke and Yoda age more quickly than Vader aged when he was close to the black hole. So this is a way of jumping into the future without aging very much. Now, you don't read as many books and see as many movies you know, as, as the people on Earth did, because in your frame of reference, very little time went by. But you propel yourself into the future, and this is a physically legitimate form of time travel. There's nothing theoretical about what I've said that's wrong to our knowledge. And indeed, GPS clocks have verified this on a much, much smaller scale. The practical difficulty of getting close to a black hole and then turning on some retro rockets so you don't get sucked in might be difficult, but but in principle, this form of time travel into the future is, uh, is, uh, is a physical reality. So if he escapes before crossing the event horizon, he will have aged less than you. Um, and your the actual lifespan is not affected, but this is a way of jumping into the future. Finally, black holes aren't entirely black, it turns out. They can evaporate. And you can learn about this in Hawking's book, a rather dense book, by the way. I like to say that this is the most purchased but least read through completion <laughs> book in the history of mankind. And people buy it, and they understand the first couple of chapters if they're lucky, and then it really gets kind of hairy. But, you know, you put it on your coffee table, and visitors come for dinner, and they say, oh, wow, you read Hawking's book. You know, you must be really intelligent. And you know, yes, yes, I understand all of it. And, in fact, very few people do. But... In this book, you can find his description of the evaporation. And the basic idea is the following. There's different ways of thinking about it. But one idea is that in the vacuum of space, even here in the air of this room, though it has nothing to do with the air itself, could be a vacuum, particles and antiparticles flit into and out of existence all the time. So they're just forming for a short time, and then they disappear. This is actually a consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And usually, for example, electrons and positrons just, they appear, and then a short time later, they disappear. And this can happen outside the black hole, and it can happen inside the black hole. Or it can happen outside the black hole, and then both of them go into the black hole. But occasionally, the pair can form, and one of the particles, it doesn't matter whether it's the matter or the antimatter, the electron or the positron, can go into the black hole, leaving the other one to escape. And from our perspective, from a distance, if you look at the equations, to us, it looks like the one that went in, went in with a negative energy, a negative mass. If this one goes in with a negative mass, that decreases the mass of the black hole a little tiny bit and exactly compensates for the amount of mass carried by the other partner particle, which can escape out to infinity. So this is a quantum mechanical evaporation process. It's one of the first steps into our ultimate desire to unify the two great pillars of modern physics, quantum physics on very small scales and general relativity on very large scales. They work very, very well in their domains of applicability, but when you try to bring them together, they're at war with one another. And so string theory is one idea for you know, melding these two theories together. We have no fully self-consistent theory of everything yet, but generically, it seems that any successful theory of this sort will have the possibility of black hole evaporation. And that's really, really cool. And that's a great triumph on Hawking's part. We've never observed this process. It's negligible for a stellar mass black hole or a supermassive black hole. They're accreting faster than they evaporate. Nevertheless, in principle, they are evaporating. And if there were little, little tiny black holes in existence shortly after the birth of the universe, then right now they might be evaporating and producing bursts of gamma rays. We've seen bursts of gamma rays, gamma ray bursts. Unfortunately for Hawking, they're quite obviously not evaporating black holes. But we still think that the evaporation process 
may well be real. Now, this is a pretty abstract concept. I teach it to my introductory astronomy non-science majors at, at Cal. To help them enjoy and remember this idea, I dress up as a black hole. This happens to be the lecture the day of Halloween, or the immediately preceding day, if Halloween happens to be on a Saturday or a Thursday or a Tuesday, because I teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I have an alien who's being spaghettified by the black hole. If I punch a little button there, he says, take me to your leader, ha, 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 ha. Anyway, uh, many people think I look like the Unabomber. Those of you um, <laughs> from a decade or so ago will remember who that was. But anyway, I don't mean to be a Unabomber. I just have these glasses that I can turn on and off and they glow. And so more to the point, I have bags of celestially themed candy attached to me. Mars bars, Milky Way bars, Orbit gum, Eclipse gum. Very important to have celestially themed candy. And after having described this rather bizarre quantum mechanical evaporation process, I then illustrate it by throwing the candy out to the crowd. In other words, I impersonate an evaporating black hole in this process. Students have come back to me 20 years later saying, you know, I didn't learn a darn thing in your class. Well, I hope they don't tell that to me. Uh, but the one thing I remember is that black holes can evaporate through this Hawking uh, process. And uh, anyway, it's negligible except for miniature black holes, but, but that's what, what, what we think happens. Now, I've heard Hawking give lectures where he says, well, that since the material eventually comes out anyway, you shouldn't even fear being gobbled up by a black hole. But, well, I don't want to say he's crazy because these lectures are available to the general public and Hawking might watch it. But I would say that that's a misrepresentation of what you might want to do if you value your health. Because you will be spaghettified on your way in. You will temporarily be compressed to nearly infinite density in the singularity. And once you evaporate, you will just be a whole bunch of subatomic particles and photons. You will not retain your existence, you know, as Andy Fracknor or Alex Filipenko or, or whoever. The information in the particles of which you consisted is still there in some weird way, and Leonard Susskin talked about that, I believe, last year or two years ago in one of the Silicon Valley lectures. But it's not exactly assembled in the same way. So I would suggest that you read Hawking's book, take most of what he has seriously, but do not throw yourself into a black hole expecting to be evaporated away and retain your identity. You won't, okay? Really abandon hope forever, all ye who enter here. So as a summary, I'll just leave this up. Physicists have said black holes could exist. It's the ultimate victory of gravity over all other forces. Observational astronomers have now found that black holes do exist. A big one in the middle of each galaxy nearly, at least each galaxy with a bulge. Stellar mass ones. And even some tentative evidence that I didn't have time to talk about, but you, you know, uh, for so-called intermediate mass black holes in the centers of certain kinds of globular clusters and stuff. And black holes are detected indirectly through their gravitational influence on their surroundings. And, that's the take-home message. One of the most bizarre predictions in all of theoretical physics has many, many known examples in the universe and appears to be a rather common phenomenon. And if you want to learn more, there's that course that unfortunately is not on sale right now. It, when it is on sale, it'll only be 40 bucks, which for 12 lectures is a deal. The course that is on sale is my giant one, the biggest course that the teaching company has ever produced. 96 lectures, normally 800 bucks, but through tomorrow, oops, I spelled, tom is, tomorrow has two M's, right? Sorry about that. Is, no, oh, good, all right. A cosmic ray hit my brain. It has two R's. Anyway, through tomorrow, it's on sale for just $230, and there is scattered through these lectures a lot of information on black holes, where I talk about stars, where I talk about galaxies, where I talk about evaporation, but it's sort of scattered around but there's lots of other astronomy as well. Okay, so anyway, um, I hope there's time for questions and thank you for being so attentive and letting, letting me overstep my bounds. Well, we have time for questions and we invite people who have questions
to line up at the two microphones right in the middle of the auditorium in front of the railing. Dr. Filipenko has agreed to answer them. We'd like to thank you in the meantime for a wonderfully illuminating lecture. And we encourage all of you who do need to leave to take your sheets with you. We don't want to leave things here in the auditorium. So we'll wait a minute for the, audit for the people who need to leave to go. And I encourage you, if you have a question, to line up in front of one of the two microphones. And then if you'll just recognize one at a time, we can go from there. That's right. Sure. I'll be glad to do that. And those who want to make a graceful exit are welcome to do so uh, now. I, uh, by the way, took a bit longer than I normally would in part because I know that this is a rather sophisticated audience. I was right. From the show of hands, uh, many, if not most of you, have been to previous lectures in the Silicon Valley lecture series, and so you already know quite a bit of astronomy. So I thought I'd tell you more than I tell, say, you know, the Rotary Club uh, during one of their breakfasts or something like that. Okay, let's, uh, most of the people are out now and there's, the noise level is sufficiently down, so why don't I start with the gentleman over here on this side. Great. What, what, what is the smallest theoretically possible, like least mass black hole? Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to repeat the questions, right? Because that's the purpose of a microphone. So um, the smallest theoretical mass for a, for a black hole is not known. Um, there could be processes early in the universe, density fluctuations, that produced rather small ones. And let me go back um, two or three slides here. Um, if you have black holes that are about the mass of a mountain, and Mount Everest is about 10 to the 15 grams or so, those are the ones that should be in the process of evaporating in their final stages right now. Less massive ones would have already evaporated. More massive ones aren't yet at the final burst. And I forgot to say that this evaporation process accelerates, and so the final stages are a, are a burst. Be because we have not found any obvious evaporating black holes, it suggests to quite a few of us that nature hasn't found a way, even shortly after the Big Bang, of actually compressing small density fluctuations into these little miniature black holes. But there's nothing in principle that prevents this. And in fact, if we had a big enough vice, what's your name? Joe. Joe. We could squeeze you, Joe, ah! and you would form a black hole. Now, the the radius, your radius, if we were to make you a black hole, would be comparable to the actual radius of a proton, wow. 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Wow. Yeah. I, you know, a proton is yay big, and I exaggerate a lot, OK? <laughs> so and, and in fact, the Large Hadron Collider might produce miniature black holes. The exciting thing is, is that under normal theory of gravitation, the energy of the Large Hadron Collider is not sufficiently big to form a little black hole. But if there are extra dimensions into which gravity can leak, then it turns out to be easier to form a black hole on small scales because gravity is stronger than you thought it was. So maybe they'll produce black holes and give evidence for extra dimensions. Um, so I would say astrophysically, the smallest ones we know of are three solar masses. But normal three solar mass stars will not typically form black holes. They'll typically form white dwarfs. And to get even a three solar mass black hole, you have to start out with an initially much more massive star. So great question. Uh, then over there. You. you mentioned that uh, most, if not all, galaxies have a central black hole. Is there any uh, theoretical consensus as to whether the stars come first to form the black hole or the black hole yeah, first? Yeah, so the, do the stars come first or the, you know, it's a chicken or egg, you know? We, we actually don't know. Um, we think it's a co-evolution of the stars and the black hole. But what we do know is that the highest redshift, that is the most distant quasars, we're seeing back when the universe was only 7, 8, 9% of its present age. Some of those quasars are so luminous that they already have to have a several billion solar mass black hole there. So either it formed first, or when it was forming, stars were also forming. And we have, we have some evidence that the first stars formed when the universe was only 300 
million years old. That's even farther back. So, so I think the answer to the question is there were some stars already, but the big black holes were beginning to form. And my best guess is that most of the star formation in the bulge and most of the black hole growth were roughly contemporaneous. But that's one of the big questions that's still outstanding. Yes, over here. Uh, if you have a binary system consisting yep. of two black holes that are spiraling in on each other um, and eventually collide with each other, could that be an, a, an observable event? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. It won't be electromagnetically observable unless those black holes each have an accretion disk around them and there's some normal matter rubbing against other matter. But if you have two bare black holes, there will be no emission of electromagnetic radiation. What there will be is the copious emission of gravity waves, ripples in the actual fabric, the shape of space-time. And physicists are now trying to find gravity waves. They've built a number of detectors, LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, and it hasn't detected anything yet. But now super and advanced LIGO are, are in the final stages of completion. And we expect that if there are, uh, you know, merging black holes in the next, say, 10 years, right? There's no guarantee that there will be one. But if there is one, we expect to detect it. And that'll be the opening up of a brand new window on the universe, gravitational waves, which are distinctly different from any form of electromagnetic radiation. And that'll be a Nobel Prize for sure, and an opening, more importantly, of a new area of astrophysics, gravitational wave astronomy. Over there, then. Your, your, your colleague, uh, Dr. Michio Kaku, was in town a few weeks ago. My colleague who? D Dr. Michio Kaku. Who, oh, Kaku, Kaku, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, so he's at the State University of New York. City University yeah. of New York, yeah. So, yeah. And, and he, he, was, uh, he was talking about his, his book, uh, Physics of the Impossible, and one, one of the things he was talking about was uh, wormholes and tr time travel through wormholes. Yeah. Or not time travel, but travel. Aren't wormholes somehow connected or tied with black holes? Aren't yeah, they somehow so related? If you look at the mathematics of general relativity, the black hole appears to be connected with another black hole, either in our universe elsewhere, or perhaps even connected with a different bubble of, you know, space, which we call other universes. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, the joke was define universe and give three examples. Now we actually think that there may well be other universes. Okay. Well, the, the connecting so-called Einstein-Rosen bridge is popularly called a wormhole. And, and I, I describe this in, in considerable detail, by the way, in this course, not to put in any more plugs for it, but I do. Um, it appears as though you could traverse it, especially in the case of a rotating black hole. In the case of a non-rotating one, um, the, the wormhole only exists for a split second of time, so you actually can't traverse it. But in the case of a rotating black hole, mathematically it looks like you can traverse it. And this idea has been used in Sagan's you know, novel Contact and things like that, right? The problem is that in any real black hole, the equations are not the idealized equations that give rise to that mathematical solution. The equations rather suggest that either the black hole, the wormhole will scrunch down, and you need some sort of in exotic anti-gravitating material to keep the throat open, or as my colleague at the University of Colorado, Andrew Hamilton, has shown, there's, um, or helped show, a number of people worked on this problem, there's something called the mass inflation instability, where a whole bunch of material and radiation collects up at the inner of the two event horizons. It turns out rotating black holes have two, not one event horizon. And near the inner event horizon, a whole bunch of radiation builds up and it fries anything that happens to traverse that region. So you get cooked. You, you don't actually make it through alive. And moreover, if there were wormholes that are traversable and are being traversed, then why haven't we ever found in the universe what's called a white hole, that is, a region of space from which matter gushes, but no matter can enter. That's the opposite of a black hole, into which stuff can go, but no matter can exit. Quasars, briefly, when they were first found, were thought you know, to be maybe white holes, but then detailed studies of them showed quite quickly that they are not white holes. 
So we've, you know, we've explored much of the universe, and these things shouldn't be subtle. Lots of radiation and matter should be gushing out, and we've never found anything like it. So I think that basically says that, that these wormholes are not traversable, or, or perhaps even they don't exist. They're just a mathematical, idealized solution, but true nature is more messy than that. But it is an interesting idea. The trouble with the wormholes is that if they're truly traversable, then you run into the problem of causality. That is, you could come back to a point in time before you were even born and prevent your parents from ever meeting, for example. I won't say kill them, that's the usual thing, kill your grandfather, but let's say, let's be a kinder, more gentler nation and just say that we're gonna prevent your grandparents or parents from ever meeting. And so you would never have been born. So then how could you make the trip which allowed you to prevent your parents from meeting, right? These violations of causality are taken very seriously by physicists and the traversable wormholes inexorably lead you to these kinds of, of, of difficulties. Great question. Yeah. I'm, I'm the guy that threw Darth Vader into the black hole. You, you threw Darth Vader in, yes. okay. And uh, I was really very disappointed that he didn't go in. He just <laughs> stayed there. Sorry. So that frustrated me, and I got the next baddest guy, and I threw him in. Yeah. And, and then he got stuck. That's right. They and, all uh, get stuck. This, 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 not just frustrated, but I got kind of mad. And so then I started getting all the bad guys I could find, and there are a lot of them, and I threw them in one at a time. Pretty soon, aren't I going to have kind of a mess there in the black hole? So everything from our perspective that has ever tried to fall into a black hole, including the star that collapsed to form the black hole, has never made it inside. Everything from our perspective is in this infinitesimally thin membrane. And indeed, Kip Thorne at Caltech developed a mathematical formalism known as the membrane paradigm. And I don't need to tell you that I discussed it in this uh, set of lectures, okay? Uh, so it's this thin membrane, okay, um, which contains all of the material that ever got thrown into a black hole. And in a sense, this allows you, from our perspective, to even understand the evaporation. Because as Leonard Susskind discussed, what's really evaporating is all this really hot material on the boundary of the black hole. It was never even really inside from our perspective, so it didn't even need to really escape. Um, yeah, so it's just a mess. It's a hot mess in an infinitesimally thin membrane just above, a Planck length above the, the event horizon. Yep. Question over there. Question with respect to the slide in which you um, explain the evaporation of a black hole. Um, my question is, if a black hole is perfectly symmetric, would it ever evaporate? Because by virtue of your definition, I figured Could out Could you speak a little bit more loudly? I'm uh, sorry. By virtue of what you have described on the evaporation of the black hole slide, you said that if, for suppose, um, say an, an antimatter or a matter enters the black hole, right. it sort of tilts the balance in, 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 in its favor. But it, yeah, that, that slide there. If the black hole were perfectly symmetric, then you should expect as much antimatter to enter as matter. Yeah, yeah, as okay. As matter. So, so this is something I didn't explain um, quite clearly enough, and I'm, I thank you for asking the question. Uh, first of all, let me tell my standard joke about matter and antimatter. It doesn't matter which we, one we called matter or antimatter. We could have called the antimatter matter, and then the matter would have been antimatter, and it doesn't matter. They're perfectly symmetric. Okay. Now, from our perspective, there was this matter-antimatter asymmetry, and for every billion proton-antiproton pairs early in the universe, there was one extra proton, and that's one of the magical things that led to our existence, okay? I say magical not because I believe in, well, I mean, you know what I mean. I mean, it's just, it's, it's one, of the, one of the accidents of nature that, that led to our existence, okay? However, it doesn't matter which one you call matter and antimatter. Regardless of whether the positron goes in, or the electron goes in, it's in either case, from our perspective, if you look at the equations, stuff going in with negative mass, negative energy. Indeed, even when you form pairs, both of them have positive mass, positive energy. It's not that the positron has a negative mass. It has all the same properties as the electron, including mass, except for its, ch its charge 
And there might be some quantum mechanical spin that might be opposite to, I'm not sure. But the mass is definitely positive, okay? So these are both positive masses. And regardless of which one goes in, it appears as a negative mass from our perspective. And that goes back to, it's related to the fact that mathematically, the spatial and temporal coordinates, space and time, from our perspective, mathematically, reverse their meaning inside a black hole. Not that we can see inside a black hole, but from the mathematics that you write down of a black hole, what we think of x and t outside the black hole become t and x inside. And that's, in a subtle way, related to this issue that, from our perspective, it goes in with negative mass. But if you don't like that perspective, and I admit it's kind of weird sounding, then just go back to my membrane paradigm. Nothing from our perspective has ever crossed the event horizon. And so you've got a hot object there, and hot objects radiate particles and light. You can think of the black hole evaporation in those terms, if you don't like this. Another way to think about it is what's called quantum mechanical tunneling. There's a particle here, and it tunnels its way out. That's similar to radioactive decay. You might have a uranium nucleus where it's, it's, it's largely stable, but a particle inside has this energy barrier that it can't quite hop over. But because it has this wave function describing it, part of the wave function penetrates this energy barrier, and the particle can suddenly find itself, again, magically, but it's quantum mechanics, outside of the nucleus, OK? okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. We have to announce that only the people standing now Ah, well, why don't you, uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry, but because of all the volume of questions, we have to say that only the people standing now are going to get a chance to ask questions in public, because we have to be respectful of the ending time yeah. of the program. So if you're standing now, stay in line, and you can ask your question. But beyond that, we're not going to have any more. Right, OK, that go. sounds good. And in part, my answers are long, because every single question has been really quite thoughtful and interesting so far. Yes. Is there a way to predict when a black hole will explode, and have we seen any that actually did that? Yeah, so we've never seen a black hole explode. Uh, otherwise, you know, Hawking would have, would, have, um, would have received a Nobel Prize by now. The only way we know of in which they can theoretically explode is through this evaporation process, which accelerates near the end. So the smaller and smaller the mass, the greater is the rate of evaporation until finally you have a truly powerful burst of gamma rays but not <laughs> any of the known gamma ray bursts, if you know what I mean, okay? But there's no other way we know of that a, that a black hole can disintegrate. So they, they don't explode the way stars do. And there's no way to predict it unless you know the mass. If you know the mass, you can calculate the evaporation rate, but then you have to also take into account the rate at which the black hole is swallowing surrounding material. So you have to have a, a very good census of what's near it and how close is it and what orbits does it have. So we have no way of right now of predicting when any particular black hole will, will evaporate. But all the stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes won't evaporate for a minimum of 10 to the 60th or 10 to the 80th power years. I've, I think it's 10 to the 80th power for stellar mass black holes and 10 to the 100th power or so, a Google for supermassive black holes. <laughs> yeah, over there now. Um, I was wondering if there was a way in which um, black holes um, can form um, with uh, dark matter. Um, is, and is there any way to, that, is there anyone who has uh, theorized on this? Obviously, it might be difficult to observe it. So yeah, I was wondering if you could that's a great question, black holes forming out of dark matter. So first, the, the simple answer, in a sense, black holes are a form of dark matter, right? They are a percentage of the dark matter we know that's out there. They are objects that gravitate, yet are invisible or very difficult to see, OK? So they are a form of dark matter. They're not the major form of dark matter. The major form of dark matter is thought to be weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs. And they're little particles left over from the earliest moments of the, of the Big Bang. Uh, it's a little bit annoying that we haven't yet definitively detected a WIMP, but they are thought by most physicists to exist. But because they are weakly interacting, 
unlike gas, which can collide and then radiate its energy through electromagnetic radiation, the weakly interacting particles rarely collide and have no way to dissipate their energy. So the weakly interacting particles form a, a, an extended halo around our galaxy. They, they go out much farther than the stars and gas in our galaxy. I mean, there's some even in this room, but mostly they're in this big halo. And there's no way to, for them to dissipate, to get rid of their energy. So there's no way for them to clump down into a small enough volume to ever collapse to form a black hole. So the so-called non-baryonic dark matter won't form black holes, but baryons, protons and neutrons, in the form of massive stars can and do form black holes and become part of the celebrated dark matter of the universe. Great question. Yes. Hi there. Uh, my original question was about wormholes, but your comment on uh, yeah. gravity waves brought something else up. So I read uh, just recently the novel Rendezvous with Raman about the ship moving without using rockets, so to speak, right? So in terms of gravity waves, is, it a way, is there a way once this field opens up to be able to use gravity waves for humans to move yeah. from point so, to point? Yeah, so probably not, because the gravity wave is a ripple going through space created by motion of two closely orbiting stars or merging white, you know, black holes or, or something like that, right? So um, the, the creatures, you know, light years away, can't capture that gravity wave. It's just a ripple moving through space. So as far as I can tell, the answer would be no. But maybe I'm just old and conservative and don't have a very vivid imagination, you know. It's sort of like some people postulate that the dark energy, which is accelerating the expansion of the universe, and which I've discussed at a previous lecture here some years ago, some people think it can be utilized to harm, you know, to, to effectively achieve warp drive. And, and I just filmed with the History Channel an episode for season five of the universe, okay? And unfortunately, they, you know, well, I mean, I think they're, hopefully, they will voice enough caveats to this, but they decided to include this possibility that dark energy could be somehow harnessed to propel objects at speeds faster than the speed of light. Not that they're moving through space faster than light, but what you do is you end up compressing space in front of it and expanding space behind it. If you do that to space, it's okay. But that effectively makes this, you know, El Corbier, you know, type drive that zips you along. And, 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 and that's, it's completely fictional right now. So, you know, Kaku likes these kinds of things, and, you know, it's great. It's, it's great to think about these things and to consider the extremes of physics, because this is how we can learn, right, by considering physics in the most extreme environments. And, and I completely applaud that. But I, I would not applaud making it seem to the general public that we have any shred of evidence that this kind of thing can be achieved right now or any time in the future. And I have very little control of what they actually end up saying in these public TV programs. And I just hope that they'll use the quotes where I said, this is an interesting idea, but it almost certainly can never be made to work. And similarly, harnessing gravity waves with my limited brain power, I don't see how that can be. But I'm not saying it's completely impossible. But nor would I want to give the impression that this is just around the corner. And, and probably Kaku didn't give that impression. I hope he didn't. And I, like I say, I, I applaud considering the physics of these things as long as you don't mislead people into thinking that this is, you know, right around the corner or wormhole travel or things like that, okay? Oh, okay, I'm trying to be very careful here in what I say. Yeah, okay, uh, question over there. Yes, in the far future, will we be able to harness energy from black holes? In the far future, will we be able to harness energy from black holes? Okay. So that's something that actually can be done. It doesn't present the, the theoretical impossibility or high improbability of some of these things that I was just now addressing, which Kaku covered in his book, The Physics of the Impossible. What he really means, it's not completely impossible, it's just highly improbable. The, the tapping of the energy of a black hole, we've actually seen nature do, even though we haven't done it yet. 
the accretion disk around a spinning black hole actually taps some of the rotational energy of the black hole. And in fact, we've seen this because some accretion disks, we think, appear anomalously bright because, in fact, they're tapping some of the energy of the rotating black hole. So nature has done this. Unlike, for example, creating a warp drive or traversal of a wormhole, we actually have some evidence that nature has done this. And even if we're wrong in those particular cases, there's no reason nature shouldn't do this in some cases. Ha will we ever do this? You know, fat chance. But, but it's nowhere near as improbable as these other things I was just discussing, like traversing a wormhole. In other words, there's nothing that's physically against the the laws of physics right now, unlike, say, the violation of causality, which would be a, a real problem, okay, if I went back in time and killed my parents. Now, in my class and in my various lectures, I discuss the possibility of an advanced civilization that has two problems. They have a lot of garbage, and they don't have enough energy. So here's how they solve their problem. They park themselves around a rotating black hole, they send garbage trucks into this region where space-time is being dragged at an incredible rate. It's called the ergosphere of a black hole. They dump their garbage at precisely the right moment. That then gives a kick to the garbage truck because the material, the garbage got dumped into the black hole at precisely the right moment. And the truck itself then gets ejected from the ergosphere with a greater kinetic energy than it had coming in. The trucks then go heading back to the civilization, having been flung this way, kind of the, like the gravitational um, effect that you know, has been used in propelling Voyager and other spacecraft to Saturn, this gravitational, um, it's called a slingshot effect, but that's a, a bad term. Um, it's also called, um, what's it called? Uh, gravity assist, yeah, thank you. Um, so then these, these garbage trucks hit a garbage truck mill. This is very much like a windmill, or a, or a water turbine, but garbage trucks hit these blades. They make them rotate. What you've got is a circuit, some coiled wire inside a magnetic field that causes a current to flow through the wire, and that lights up your light bulbs. So they've solved their energy problem and their garbage problem simultaneously. Okay. Now, you don't want to throw too much into the black hole without moving your civilization comfortably farther out, right? Because otherwise it'll envelop you. Okay, here, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, young man. What if you just jump into the black hole just when it's turned into gas? If you, if you jump into the black hole just at the last stages of evaporation, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. It, it wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, <laughs> because um, you would be subjected to enormously strong, high-energy particles and waves, gamma rays and other electromagnetic radiation, that would fry you, young man. So don't do it. Not that there's much danger, because we've never found a microscopic evaporating you know, black hole. But, but don't do it even if you find one. Thank you for the question. Question over there now. Another young man. Good. I love to see this. Uh, um, well, what about? white holes and could they be feeding on well if black holes suck things in maybe they're launching it out of you know all universes but into this strange sort of a place outside all universes and that's yeah. where white holes feed on the things that that yeah. are out there and they just put So that's them a very good in. idea. You you caught what I was saying that stuff going into a black hole at least theoretically, might traverse the wormhole and come out of a white hole. So what you're saying is, suppose all the white holes are in other universes, and that's why we don't see any of them. But by the same token, then, wouldn't we expect black holes in those universes to have wormholes connecting up with ours and spewing matter out of white holes within our universe? You'd have to postulate a very special universe, our universe, that only has black holes connecting up to other universes but no black holes in those other universes connecting up to ours. And that just seems improbable. Yeah. Well, what if there's just, you know, like, white holes just 
way, way out there that well, we can't right. detect. So the thing is, they'd be bright, right? They're, they're ejecting all the stuff that the black hole at the other end ev you know, ever accreted, ever swallowed. And um, you know, from the materials perspective that's falling in, by the way, it does cross the event horizon. Clocks are running at the normal rate, blah, blah, blah. So these things should be very bright. They shouldn't be subtle. They should be extremely obvious. And with today's powerful arsenal of telescopes, most of us think that bright things, all the bright things in the universe have, have pretty much been discovered. So that's, you know, it's not impossible, but we think it's improbable. Yes? This with the two black holes forming, but what if um, two black holes, or well, a black hole formed and started sucking in more stars to get the energy like the neutral stars, and it formed with another black hole? Is it possible that it could just keep growing, or is there like any limit to it? Or yeah, bla it just... black holes can definitely keep growing. In fact, the black hole in the middle of every galaxy that's active is growing, growing at a rate of, you know, maybe a, a solar mass per year. Now, if it's already a billion solar masses, that means that it'll take another billion years for it to double its mass. Nevertheless, that's not, you know, I mean, the universe is 10 billion, 14 billion years old, so there's, that's how we think black holes grew from small, humble beginnings in the middle of little galaxies to bigger and bigger things as more and more material got accreted, forming a bigger and bigger bulge of these galaxies. So, so they definitely grow. So is it possible that they could just keep on sucking more and more galaxies? Yeah, so then, you know, we are we then in any danger, a nice, comfortable 27,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way? We're not in, in any great danger. We're in a stable orbit around the center of the Milky Way. We're very, very far away. The event horizon of the black hole in the middle of our galaxy is only 12 million kilometers. It's three kilometers for every solar mass, and I told you it's four million solar masses. So, so 12 million kilometers sounds like a lot, but that's a, less than a tenth of the distance from the Earth to the sun. So the black hole in the middle of our galaxy is small. Even if there happened to be a gravitational interaction of our sun and our solar system with another star, gravitationally flinging our solar system toward the general vicinity of the center of our galaxy, you'd have to have pretty good aim for us to be aimed sufficiently precisely at this physically very small object. A black hole is very small, okay? They're easy to miss. Okay. So, so, you know, it's not impossible that our solar system will someday be eaten, but it's highly improbable. And it's one of these things that the TV shows want us to play up, that we might get eaten by a black hole, but it's a, it's a bit of a... It's a bit unfortunate because people then think that they're, we're in grave danger of being eaten by a black hole, and we're not. It's not a physical impossibility, but there are many other things to worry about that are uh, much more germane to your everyday life. Question over there. If, uh, what, would, what would it be like if a uh, black hole were to, were to suck in the Earth, like, would the Earth be sp sp spaghettified? Yeah, the Earth would be spaghettified if Earth were going into a stellar mass black hole. If it were being sucked into a supermassive black hole, then the Earth would get spaghettified eventually, but not outside the event horizon, not outside the boundary. So it's just a matter of time. When do you want to get spaghettified? if you really do desert, des decide to make a journey into a black hole. You're going to get spaghettified eventually. If you choose to remain outside the black hole and not get spaghettified, then choose a supermassive black hole where the tidal forces are much, much less than those near a stellar mass black hole. But yes, the Earth would get ripped apart. Everything gets ripped apart. Well, including all, all humans living. Yeah, yeah. Living tissue would easily get ripped apart, much more easily than an iron you know, rod or something like that, because then you have to get into the complicated stuff, you know, strength of materials. Different materials have different strengths, and it's much easier to pull a human apart than it is to pull an iron rod apart. And so I actually, I must admit, have not done the calculation uh, of whether an iron rod would get pulled apart outside the event horizon of a 10 solar mass black hole. 
an iron rod might survive, but you, living tissue and flesh, would not survive if you're studying the black hole and you want to write a PhD thesis about it. The iron rod would eventually get destroyed if it goes inside. Everything, even kryptonite, if it were to exist, would get destroyed inside the black hole. But outside the event horizon, it depends on the size of the black hole and on the strength of the materials. If you're the consistency of souffle, you get ripped apart much more easily than if you're an iron rod. <laughs> Question there. Well, is the steam on? Yeah. Okay, so um, I don't know if like you were uh, you were talking about a guy over there getting spaghettified, and um, I wasn't even listening. But I started listening then. But uh, oh, that's if, too bad. Yeah. So if you got into a black hole and you don't get ripped apart, like say you just don't, you don't just get ripped apart, right. what if um, you stay in there? Can yeah. you stay? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Suppose you don't get ripped apart and your brain cells don't all just disintegrate and all that. Can you stay there arbitrarily long? The answer is no. No matter how powerful your rockets and no matter which direction you aim them in, you can only prolong your life by a certain maximum amount, and it's a very small amount. Now, you can take bad trajectories that make you die in the singularity more quickly, but even the best possible trajectory leads to a very, very short life. And I believe that for the supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy, it's of order one minute. And for stellar mass black holes, it's, it's a small fraction of a second. So you have a maximum time to live regardless of your trajectory. And then, even if you were to survive or not get spaghettified, you would then get crushed into this singularity, a point in classical general relativity which has infinite density, because by that I mean a finite amount of matter gets compressed into a mathematical point. Now, a mathematical point is a point of zero volume. So some non-zero amount of matter divided by zero volume is an infinite density. This is where we think classical general relativity breaks down. Whenever, yeah. Whenever we've considered very small things in the history of physics, especially in 20th century physics, that's what it was all about, we find that things are not point-like, even particles aren't point-like. They have some fuzziness, they have some size. That's where quantum mechanics comes in. So presumably when we develop finally, eventually, a truly self-consistent quantum theory of gravity, be it string theory or quantum loop gravity or some other thing, we will find that the singularity is very, very small, very, very dense, but not infinitesimally small and not infinitely dense. But listen, between you and me, whether I'm compressed to infinite density or for all practical purposes, infinite density hardly matters. And that'll happen within a very short, finite amount of time once you enter the event horizon. Question over there. Oh, more young ones, that's great. Is there anything behind a black hole? Oh, cool. So a black hole, especially a non-rotating one, is basically a spherical object. You look at it from any direction, it looks spherical. The bending of space that I tried to illustrate near the beginning of my lecture is a bending into a fourth spatial dimension, which has mathematical uh, reality. I mean, you can write equations that, that have this dimension as part of the equations, but it's physically inaccessible. So it bends off into some direction, and we can't see it. It's like a balloon. Think of your universe being a two-dimensional balloon, just the surface. You can wander around on the surface, and let's say the laws of physics prevent you from going into the balloon, right, inside. But I could, I could take my finger and I could push on the balloon and make it bend into the inside, but the creatures on the surface constrained by the laws of physics to only physically access the surface, they can only mathematically conceive of this other dimension, okay? But that's the dimension into which a black hole curves space. So really, there's, there's nothing behind a black hole. In other words, just take a spherical ball and, you know, whatever you are, there's something behind it, but it's nothing special, right? I mean, if there were a black hole between me and you, you would be behind the black hole from my perspective, and I would be the black hole from your perspective. Now, you may be a fine person, and I think that I'm an okay guy, but it's not a particularly exciting thing 
when you're behind the black hole from my perspective and I'm the behind the black hole from your perspective. So that's the sense in which I say that there's nothing special behind a black hole. You okay. see? Does that make some sense? Yes. Cool. Okay, and then the other young one there. Good. Most people uh, draw black holes as a circle, and are they a circle or a sphere? It's a sphere. So we draw them as circles just because of the confines of the two-dimensional plane of the blackboard or the you know, projector screen or whatever. But yeah, they're, they're spherical regions for a non-rotating black hole, for sure. And even a rotating black hole is, is a sphere, but around it has this weird kind of elliptical torus-shaped region, the ergosphere, from which you can tap the energy, OK? Anyway, um, yeah, they're spheres, and the, and the bending occurs into a different dimension. And we just draw them as circles for simplicity. <laughs> cool. And then a question right there. I believe you might be the last okay. one. Oh, back. Ah, okay. You've been talking about all evening about two, which to me seem contradictory ideas. On the one hand, black ho big black holes like at the center of our galaxies have been growing in size as they acquire several million solar masses. And, and I guess in even bigger galaxies, even billions of yeah, solar billions, masses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so their event horizons have been growing in size. But on the other hand, you've said that things falling into the black hole get stuck just outside the event horizon. Right. So if those things can't pass through the event horizon, yeah. can't the event horizon grow past them? Or is somehow the right. event horizon pushing things on its yeah. skin yeah. outward. Yeah, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Good, good question. Th this is the essence of relativity. People in, and creatures in different frames of reference yeah. see nature unfolding in different ways. And they're both right. And you see this in, even in special relativity, you know, a, a particle zipping along through your lab frame that normally sitting on a desk would decay into other particles it lasts a long time, and you say, yes, it lasts a long time before decaying because its clocks are running slowly. Um, the particle itself, from its frame of reference, says, no, I don't last a long time. Yeah. Your lab is incredibly yeah. short, and that's how I got from yeah. one side of the lab to the other, whereas I, in my frame of reference, say that it got from one side of the lab to the other by, by living a long time. So, so um, in the case of the black holes, from our perspective outside the black hole, nothing ever crosses. From the perspective of the infalling material, that's a different frame of reference. It can and does cross the event horizon. So then going back to your conundrum, what about the membrane? Well, as stuff accretes onto this membrane, the membrane radius grows. It just it expands like a balloon. You're going like that, and it, it just grows. And it, and it never passes up the material. In other words, it continually pushes out the material that, that constitutes the membrane. Stars falling into our mass black hole in the center of our galaxy are then actually being pushed outward. Um, our Th that's right. From our perspective, and you lost the microphone there, uh, but what the gentleman said was that from our perspective, the material of which the stars that are being swallowed by the black hole consists, which I claim is on this membrane, as the black hole is growing, that material is being pushed out to greater and greater radii. That, that's exactly right. That's what's happening in our frame of reference, yeah. And it's, it's hard to bend one's mind around these ideas of relativity. Um, but to the degree that we've measured experimental effects at, for example, low speeds when testing special relativity. And this has been done with clocks and airplanes and stuff. Clocks run more slowly when they're traveling at a high speed relative to us. And to the degree that we've measured the effects of general relativity in weak gravitational fields, example, GPS, stronger gravitational field, there are things called binary neutron stars, pulsars, which orbit one another, and they're emitting gravity waves, and that changes their orbit. And we've seen changes in those orbits that are exactly matching up with the predictions of the equations. To that degree, we've tested relativity. And 
though we have not tested it in the what's called the strong field approximation of, of, of black holes, we have no reason to doubt it based on what we've tested so far. But we do not know it to be absolutely true. In science, you never know anything to be absolutely true the way you do in a mathematical proof. All you have is a progressively better, more complete description that accounts for things that are seen and correctly predicts so far unobserved phenomena, which then experimentalists and observers try to find. And when you do confirm the predictions, that's another feather in your hat, but you still don't know whether this is ultimate reality. It's just our best description of what we consider to be reality. Okay, well, you've been, you've been great, you know, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. And a, a, as I knew would be the case, the, the questions were really outstanding. So uh, congratulate yourselves on coming. And so were the answers. Oh, well, thank yeah. you. <laughs>